that we're going to do a photo contest? Who the hell knows what, I, what the judge is like? You know, it all depends on what the judge is like. It's got nothing to do with anything else. So we've come up with a, with a system to evaluate your photos consistently. If the photograph has had its basic technical level completed successfully, is it sharp? Is it well exposed? You know, does it have the right depth of field? Then you give it a two. If it's of an interesting subject, something you want to look at, <coughs> you ever heard somebody judge say, well, what's the subject of this photo? Okay, that's an issue, right? What, what are we taking a picture of again? That's a give it a two. So if we got those two things, we've got a four, and if it's artistically composed, then you give it another two. So every perfect photo then becomes a six. six. Zero to six. Zero? Not so good. Six? Okay. This may not be an award-winning photo, but it is technically perfect. It is as good as you could give it, at, given the conditions under which you took it. So, if anybody, everybody next week, if you want to bring one or two photos, we'll put a, a print, we'll put them up here. We'll go through with post-its. That's what we did up in Madison. And we'll, we'll evaluate them based on that. And it, it's, it's nothing personal. <laughs> It's just, you know, in Madison, out of, out of 102 photos, we had one six and no zeros. Everything was two, three, and four, which means everybody was a lazy photographer. That's what that means. You only did just enough to get the image. Okay, you didn't go beyond what it meant. So, you, you interested in doing that? Please do. We'll, we'll come all around and then. All right. Well, as far as I'm concerned, this was the best photo I could take under these conditions at this time. It's not the best photo I've ever taken, but given a set of conditions, I would give that a six. It wouldn't be an award winning, but it's as good as it can be. Same thing with this one, okay? But if you get used to doing this, if you get used to taking every image that you take I want it to be absolutely perfect. What does that mean when you get an extraordinary opportunity? You do it. It becomes routine. You don't say, God, I hope I got that. You just say, oh, look. Yeah, see? Oh, you know, it's not an issue. Oh, look, bee eaters on the Kalango River driving down a canoe. Look, oh, there they are. They're, boom, you, you just do it. Okay, you just, it just becomes routine. That's what we want, is for you to be able to take perfect images routinely, and then when you get extraordinary opportunities, it becomes routine too. Okay, it's like shooting free throws. I can shoot free throws still all day in the gym, but it's in the finals of the NCAA tournament with one second ago, you're two points behind, you got, it's a little bit different. But not if you've done enough, right? Do the same thing. So the opportunity is to take ordinary subjects, ordinary images, and turn them into extraordinary images by doing extraordinary things. Getting close, getting, you know, position right, all those sorts of things. That's what we want to be able to do. So you want to take a prairie? I call this prairie molecule. Okay? It's a very different view of a prairie rattlesnake master. Right. So, Composition. It's very simple. The creation of some sort of order and the apparent disorder of chaos in nature by removing some and organizing other elements in the viewfinder. You know, no chainsaws, no heat waggers. You, you learn to, by controlling your camera, you learn to optically make things happen. Okay? This was in a bog in winter, it was 54 degrees below zero. None of that is relevant to getting the image. You have to do what you need to do to get the image. Okay? This image is a very different image, it has very different techniques, but it's, it's about getting the image. All right, how you compose? Charles Darwin wrote a letter home to the building. He says, if, uh, in Beagle, he says, if the eye attempts to follow the flight of a gaudy butterfly and is arrested by some single tree or fruit, if watching an insect one forgets it in a strange flower, it is crawling over, 
In turn, the admired suspended scene with the individual character of the foreground fixes the attention. The mind is the chaos of delight. That is not the way to go about organizing a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> you ever take the kids on a field trip? Mm. Oh, look, this would this be, this would yes. be. <laughs> well, I want you to look at this. But what's that over there? No, that's not the way to go about it. You have to focus on, no pun intended, you have to focus on something. You have to intend to do something. Maybe here's, a, here's another way to look at it. This guy said, we are driven by a desire to capture life simultaneous complexity and simplicity in a single image of work. Chevy Chase, vacation, goes up to Grand Canyon. Got it, let's go. <laughs> I've seen it, you know. Some are created simple images with huge and complex overtones. Others have spun up complex images that imply a simple word beneath. All that simply means is when you get an opportunity, don't take a single image and walk away. Work it. There's lots of opportunities. Okay. So the role of composition. How you decide? If you want to shoot a prairie fire, there's multiple ways to shoot a prairie fire. There's fire, close up of the fire, there's a reflection of the fire in clouds. All those can be affected. The other thing is that when things are happening, when things are in transition, we call it chaos, from the bright, stable order to black, impenetrable gyrations of token. Those are the interesting places. Those are where the extraordinary photos are made. Okay? Same thing, same time, same place, chaos, and yet two very, very different images of the same thing. This is where it's interesting. When they're all sitting in a cornfield feeding, not so interesting. Okay? That's what we're talking about. And when I wrote about this, I said, pulling an image from this black and white melee was like trying to extract a few teeth from the mouth of a threshing great white shark. And I should have said, with a forceps. Okay? This is a Bosque del Apache. This is at Imaquan, too. Yeah. But it's bewildering when it happens. And you have to, you have, to have a mental template and, and a quickness to figure out what it is you want to do. And, and you go after the image that you want. Or not just a single image, okay? All right. Field guide perception. We're so happy to have the opportunity to create an image, a great image. We, we stop. Oh, look, there's a juvenile golden eagle. I got it. So if I were to evaluate on my scale, that would be a four. It's technically correct, well exposed, interesting subject, the composure. The composition is gone, it sucks, right? Not there. So that would be a four out of six image. And what we call that because, we call that the bullseye syndrome. You know, you can't really see the subject, but if you look right in the center there, that dot, we were at Kennecut Cove, or at the, we were in Forest Glen the other night, we saw this beautiful stump, half white, half black. We just been given a talk, it was dusk, I said, oh, look at that, I've never seen. She said, oh, I got my iPhone, so she sticks out the window and <laughs> makes a picture of her iPhone. And we get back to the lab, and there's this white dot, about the size of a period, right in the middle, you know. Yeah. So, bottom line is composition, everything in the middle. Not so, you know, if you, if you look in your viewfinder, you see things all over the place, those little dots that focus. That's why they're not all in the center. Okay. Okay, are there any rules for composition? Not rules, but it's America. We don't have rules for anything, right? <laughs> there are innumerable ways of organizing a photograph that are not hard and fast rules, but there are some useful approaches, some useful ways to think about it. Okay? We call them templates. We all have templates of creativity. In other words, the ways of beginning to think about things without having to reinvent the wheel every time. We call those our vocabulary. Sue gives you a vocabulary. I have a visual vocabulary of images. When I see something, that automatically goes through my mind, and I, I say, which one of those do I apply to this subject, and, and how do I make it happen in the camera? That's the process of photography. So, because 35, all your cameras aren't square, has a 3 to 2 ratio, the simplest compositional element is Horizontal or vertical, right? Some images are horizontal, 
No, some are vertical. Does it matter? I don't know. Well, there's, a, there's an image. Like, okay. There's the same image. This one says, you know, they're, they're, they're different. So like one over the other. I don't know. I seem to like this one. There's that one. You might like that one. There's another one. Traditionally, you would, you would portray that that way or this way, whichever one. So it gives you a little bit, it gives you just a different perspective on it. Here's another one. This one is traditional. This one is a little more, oh, you know, you get a little, a little bit more impact from it. So it's a good thing to think about. Some images are, would not work very well uh, the other way. Here's one that's traditionally horizontal. Here's one that's vertical. This one wouldn't work at all as a horizontal because, you know, this one. Here's an American painted lady. Here's a grand female. So sometimes the subject dictates it, and sometimes you can turn it back and forth just to turn things around. Okay. The golden mean has been around since the Greeks. We call it the rule of thirds. I don't like the term rule of thirds because that implies you have to do it. Right? So the golden mean. So what you do is you take your camera and you you take a little sharp and write on the viewfinder if you want, you don't have to. You mentally divide it into thirds. And everywhere there's a line intersection, stick a subject. Or an horizon line. The horizon line is a subject of the photo. Okay. So that's a good rule. Anybody ever use that? Well, there's one. You can see the grid. Loop, loop, loop. If this one through the middle, it's not as interesting because it bisects it. Okay? Asymmetrical is always more interesting than symmetrical. Here, this grasshopper is going, oh, what is he going to do? What's he looking at? If you sat in the center, you look at the image and you don't see the entire photo. Okay? There's another one. It makes makes for dynamic tension in images. Oh, what's, what's this guy going to do? It's an acorn needle. You want to see acorn weevils look at acorns in the fall. They're sitting on them. Okay. Here, and have a look. There's the grid. This is a very nice tree frog, but it gives you a more pleasing view of the landscape. There's another one. Another one. You can not use anything except that and, and, and you know, be an acceptable. Another one. Okay. Down here, dead bison. Still see the grid. Nothing's in the center here. Okay. It simply makes you, it, it leads you in, brings you in, makes you want to look at the image. Okay. Same thing here. The grid. You've got this metal image, and as soon as you use a viewfinder, oh, that's the image I want, and you take it. Okay. Even something that's in the center is not in the center because it's African ground you know, this is that dissection of the line, it's right there, but it's a subject even though it's full of tips, you know. All right. That's not the only compositional template, parallel lines. Well, we all know there's no such thing as parallel lines in nature. It's simply a man-made phenomenon. You know, maybe not. Maybe not. All these are parallel lines. Okay. And then there are parallel lines with what we call intrusive elements in them. Hmm. What's that? Parallel lines with a, oops, what happened here? You know, you wonder, did the cactus get injured or why aren't they parallel? Or, you know, those parallel lines with an intrusive element. You begin to think, see, operate like a photographer because you say, oh, I have all these visual templates in my brain. Parallel lines, inclusive element. Parallel lines, you know, it's an okay photo without that, but it's a much better photo with this inclusive element. There's one. Parallel lines, woo. You know, not often you see snakes crawl down trees, and they can crawl down trees as well as crawl up. Okay. It'll be eating profanitary warbler babies. It'll be a little 
the old pin feathers on its mouth. Oh. All right, and just pure intrusive elements. What is that? It means something that draws the eye and adds interest. Okay? So when I were hiking in the Appalachians, and oh, look, the glacial boulder, uh, the field of ferns. Where's the intrusive element? The boulder, of course, right? Saying that we're coming back from the hike, and look what had happened. Oh, the intrusive element has an intrusive element on it. Also, that makes it more interesting. Okay, if you were doing a journal page, you could add that. I'm gonna put a leaf on that. Here's the intrusive element. This line, you get this field of trilliums. You see this curve. It tells you, oh, these things are growing in a, in a forest and a down woody vegetation. You know, this is probably old growth. So it tells you a lot more information than just, and sometimes you use intrusive elements simply because you can't get close enough. I didn't have enough lens, so I said, oh look, I use the law of thirds, and I put the moose there, and that's what I intended to do. You know, if the moose is sitting right up here, it, it looks like you tried, you know, you just took a picture of the moose and going out of the car, flipping down the road. This actually is a composed image. Chaos. Chaos is a very, very good, particularly over here at Emmaus. There's all sorts of things going on. There's vegetation going all over the place, you know, cattails growing, birds flying all over the place. That's a very, very good compositional tool. This line is going all over the place. Okay. Here's one. That, here's the line just going all over the place. And yet, you can still use that rule of thirds. You can combine two elements. Because where is it? It's not the center. It's over here. So, oh, yeah, span. I want to spend my weekend walking through this joke. You know, you don't want to do that. 